is half Korean. <laughs> was, that in, was that in English or was that in Korean? <laughs> Ilona is the daughter of Victor Wellington Peters and Ruth Hahn Peters. Dr. Peters, while studying at Princeton Seminary, received his approval to be a missionary in Korea from the Methodist Church on March 23rd, 1928. He would serve as a missionary in Korea until 1941. During that time, he conducted revivals and Bible institutes in all parts of the country, including Seoul and Tegu and Gwangju in the south, Heju and Chin Nampo on the west coast, Kan Nang and Kosong on the east coast, all the way to the Korean settlements in Manchuria and even Peking, now Beijing, China. Often teaching and preaching, get this, up to seven times a day. From 1934 through 1936, in Kaesong, his was uh, ministering as a boys' middle school counselor, as well as preaching and teaching. Then in 1937, he literally designed and was involved in the building and planting of a church in Kimwa, which is now North Korea. 
On February 12, 1938, he married Hong Hung Bok, known to us as Ruth Han Peters. And the Lord blessed them with four wonderful children, Grace, who was born in Korea, Margaret, Ilona, and Mel. Now, when I thought about this service today, I thought how interesting it would be for both of our congregations to hear what it was like to grow up in the home of a pioneer missionary. The impact that's that this has had on the whole family, the impact that it had on Alona as she married a missionary, and Armin has his own unique story to tell, and how they too have served the Lord in Asia. And to facilitate all of this, Armin and Alona's son Byron is going to interview them. Now, Byron, as many of you know, and all of us actually for both congregations should know, Byron and his wife Robin are also missionaries currently serving with World Impact here in Los Angeles. And as I mentioned, here is another way that our two congregations are joined together. Both Temple Baptist Church and Fullerton Young Nakyohe support Byron and Robin Simpson. Another dynamic on how the Seamson legacy unites our two congregations. Will you welcome with me Ilona Seamson, Armin, and Byron? Now we want to record this so you're all going to get microphones, all three of you. Yeah, thank you, Pastor Joe. I need to apologize for Robin. She's home with some sick children today. She would have loved to have been here. Also feel a little bit overwhelmed that we're getting all the attention. We have some other wonderful missionaries here who didn't serve in Korea, but did serve. The Milbys are with us. I don't know who else. So, um, But yes, uh, we, we are uh, uh, blessed to have had a ministry with Koreans, and I enjoyed helping out with the English ministry at Young Nok Church. And I thank you for giving me that opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Um, okay, we heard uh, from Pastor Joe about your, your father and your mother, Mom. I'll go ahead and call her Mom the rest of this time. By the way, that was Byron who was screaming in my arms in that picture. He's been shouting ever since. No, I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, Mom, is there anything else you would like to tell us about your father, their life, and their ministry? Uh, at home or abroad or... Oh, okay. I had a jolt a few minutes ago when Pastor Dave said the greatest missionary was Paul because I always thought it was my dad. <laughs> anyway, um, he was just a wonderful man, just the most godly person. All of the people who knew him said if they ever feared that the rapture happened and they were left behind, they were going to call Dr. Peters. And if my mom answered the phone, they would say, quick, is, tell us, is Victor still here? <laughs> you know, because if he's... If he's here, we're okay too. <laughs> we didn't miss the rapture. Um, my brother, being the only son, I guess the girls were sweeter and more, and more compliant. <laughs> he said, how can I grow up? How, can I, how do I compete? How, do I, how can I ever be as godly a man as my father? And how can I ever be as spiritual as these Koreans that he keeps telling us about? Walk through snow at 4 a.m. in the morning to pray, you know, you know miles from their to get the church from their homes. And, and uh, so he, he always kind of felt inadequate, <laughs> I think. But um, let's see. Uh, um, I'll just start with one of my best childhood, one of my best memories of all time was I would often go to my dad with questions about life and church and whatever. And he always had a quiet, wise answer, maybe one or two sentences. Sometimes it'd be at night, I tiptoed in his room and sometimes I would tiptoe quietly out because he'd be on his knees in prayer at his bedside. And that was the most wonderful image. And he and mom would quote favorite scripture verses in bed. 
In fact, when mom was in her last illness, when we would take care of her, we could hear them quoting together. And of course, after a while, she would just be quoting a little bit, and then after a while, it was just his voice alone when she was her weakest, but we'd stand at the door and cry <laughs> listening to that. Anyway, uh, to have a godly father so loving and uncon with that unconditional love really made us help us trust a heavenly father and know he has unconditional love too. Your father was also known for his love for Korea and living like a Korean. Could you tell us more about right. that? Right. You know, in closing, I will read a little paragraph he himself wrote. But yes, he's known. When we were there, a taxi driver we were with said, Oh, I've heard about him. We studied about him in school. He was the one that became one of us. He became a Korean, and I'll read a little bit more of that. Okay. Yeah, he dressed like a Korean. Uh, when he arrived in, in Korea, he, he was actually in a missionary compound. Back then, all the missionaries lived in a compound, and he's saying, even though I'm in Korea, I'm not in Korea. All the Koreans out there, he started seeing the smoke rising from the buildings, and he said, what are they doing? How, you know, what are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their hurts? I'm not in Korea. So he asked the missionaries if he could move to a Korean house, and they were kind of startled, but he began living amongst the Koreans, and uh, like I said, dressing like a Korean. Gave his first sermon in Korean at, uh, after three months, so he's uh, pretty phenomenal, and courted and married a Korean. So, uh, Dad, um, you and Mom served at, in Korea as missionaries, uh, first teaching at Seoul Foreign School from 1967 to 1969. And then in 1979 to 2004, you served with Wycliffe Bible Translators, first in Papua New Guinea, and then in their home office here in Huntington Beach. Uh, it seems that uh, you have missionary service in your blood, but your parents weren't missionaries. Uh, what factors influenced you to think about becoming a missionary? I Why think. Not? I think uh, it was all related to the culture I grew up in at that time, to uh, church culture. Our pastor, Dr. Thomas, had been a missionary in India, and uh, for different reasons he had to return home and take a pastorate, but he was very constantly missions-minded. Uh, and you saw that in the people that he selected to work under him, and he mentored that went to the mission field uh, over and over. The youth pastors would be those who would be going to Ceylon, to Taiwan, to other places. Uh, part of our program, too, there at church, every fourth Sunday was Mission Sunday. And we had speakers in at that time. But we had uh, not only uh, people that had gone from the U.S., overseas, but people that came from Ireland, that came from South Africa, that came from uh, Guatemala, that came from uh, Venezuela to come and share uh, mission stories. Uh, one of the things that was a factor also was we had a men's fellowship every uh, month, once a month, and in those we had dynamic speakers that really called for the uh, purpose of missions. Uh, and I mean, we had Bill Bright, uh, Louis Zamperini, who just recently died. Uh, these are all people in Southern California area that came. A big influence in our church, even though she wasn't there, but she influenced our youth pastors, and that was Henrietta Mears. And we had uh, a lot of contact with that fellowship. Uh, another factor in that was youth summer camps. And I remember one summer camp in particular where there was a speaker uh, by the name of Mel Lyons from Africa. And he talked about the South Pacific and the islands, the thousands of islands that had never heard uh, the name Jesus Christ except as a swear word. And um, that really didn't register with me until we went to Papua New Guinea. Uh, but that was an important time. Another thing was factors of people that were in our home. My parents hosted many, many missionaries uh, in our home. Uh, among those was George Broughton, and uh, another was Rachel Saint in Dayuma. 
uh, were in our home on several different occasions. And um, that was important in me learning about them. A big event in our lives, talking about that, was the martyr of the five missionaries in Ecuador. And that <coughs> impacted lives tremendously. From the time I was in fifth grade, I wanted to go to Wheaton College. And um, I, even though I didn't finish up there, that was one of the biggest joys and blessings of my life to be able to go to Wheaton and, of course, the missions-mindedness there. Another thing is out of my group. There were many of us that went into full-time service. Marshall Stevens, Ken Holcomb, uh, Scott Grandi, etc. cetera. Um, but um, that was it. It was uh, a real time of real blessing and emphasis of the church and my family on us. Thank you. Yeah, I don't get out to uh, as many churches to make this scientific, but I, I would I would say that Temple is a rare breed these days. Um, you still have a missions committee. A lot of the churches that support us don't even have missions committees. Uh, many of us have never even allowed us to speak up front like this. Uh, you guys are a rare breed. You're, you're a blessing to us. Um, but it, it really helps when the church has a culture of sending missionaries. Okay, so mom, not all pastors' kids become uh, pastors, right? And not all missionary kids become missionaries. At, uh, first of all, are your sisters or brothers missionaries? Or? Uh, not in the sense of going overseas, but they've... Uh, oh, Grace, the oldest one on the left, became a pastor's wife and, and uh, played the piano. And it's kind of like Jan does in, and uh, Linda, how they serve the church in so many ways, sometimes behind the scenes. Margaret and her husband, they've taken people in that needed homes. He, uh, her husband, a coach, had... Bible studies for track teams. Our brother, believe it or not, through a difficult divorce, he, he came really back close to God. He says, the Psalms are really speaking to me for the first time. We've been praying for him for years. And, and God, uh, I think mom had to go to heaven for her to tug on God's sleeve to say, send her a beautiful Korean wife. And now he has a wonderful Korean wife and uh, who sings, of course, beautifully. And, and it's just a wonderful gift of God. So how did you then sense God's calling on your life to become a We were a just always open, of course, Armin, was at, like where to serve. Not, I used to think like if you're really dedicated, you would go overseas. You go to Africa, that was the emphasis when I was growing up. Or if you're really dedicated, Wycliffe member, you'd be a Bible translator suffering in the sweating villages, you know. <laughs> it, it's just anywhere and every, everywhere. My, my parents were always so joyful. They had never had much, but they had a grateful heart, loved God so much. We never felt we would have to suffer. In fact, in Papua New Guinea, our Byron sister got her horse finally. She dreamed for years. Of we'll cut off the interview right there. Right? Okay. So all of us missionaries live in hardship. <laughs> yeah, so. anyway. You will not be deprived, sir. as all of you know, serving God with your whole heart. You will be blessed with beyond measure. Yeah, we do have a little display over there. <laughs> Sorry. Can I read? Oh. Yes, I've, I've crammed some things on that table, but for those of you who are romantics, I've actually brought some love letters. You'll have to be able to read Korean. And, uh, <laughs> love letters from my uh, grandma to my grandpa and my grandpa to... Uh, my grandmother, and different artifacts. Uh, his diary, which is also written in Korean. Um, Some pictures that my dad and, and I did, and um, cal calligraphy is his. Uh, and and, and a, a horsehair hat, and the little dress back there is the one I'm wearing there. So that's a real relic. Don't touch it, it'll turn to dust. <laughs> 69 years old. <laughs> okay. 69? That dress is. Oh. oh. Okay. <laughs> I thought... <laughs> In Korean culture, age is respected. I don't lie about my age. I'm a proud 71. Not how many? How do I, what am I? Anyway, this is my dad's words in 1931. He when he was about 29 years old. So you can guess what uh, a specially gifted man he was. 
Uh, when he arrived in, in Korea, he fell in love. He saw the Koreans in their peasant white garb. He said, they're angels. And he said, the black hair and the dark eyes. Oh, he said, there's no more beautiful people on earth as we, as we know. <laughs> no, <laughs> half of me <laughs> is, is very beautiful. No, okay. So, uh, <laughs> What's the other half? And, uh, Anyway, he, this is just an excerpt. He said, I did not have to learn to like Korean food. I liked the first taste and enjoyed it more all the time. Moreover, it's, you see, he's still early in the years in Korea. It seemed only natural to put on Korean clothes. I felt strange and uncomfortable in foreign clothes and regretted that I had brought any with me from America. I longed for a Korean home, and that too God gave me. God has blessed me exceeding abundantly. He knew before I was born where I should work, and it seems he prepared me beforehand, especially for Korea. I envy Koreans very much and wish I could become one of them in appearance and thought and word. I cannot be thankful enough that God led me to Korea, and I shudder to think what I have missed had I gone to some other country. This blessing was worth waiting for. I'm learning much from Koreans. I learned faith in America. I'm learning love in Korea. I'm constantly put to shame for my weak love when I see the unselfishness and generosity and hospitality of the Koreans. And those who have had far less advantages than I have penetrated much farther into the deep things of God. I do not know a people on earth naturally so endowed with aptitude for Christianity. Now, this. I think you'll agree it's pretty prophetic. This is what he's saying in 1931. I believe Korea has a destiny to fulfill if the Lord tarries. Not only is Korea peculiarly susceptible to the gospel, but her position in the center of the East is purposeful, I believe, in the plan of God. And even her tribulations may be providential. What nation has God used to bless the world more than Israel? And what nation has suffered more? I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid, he has not cast away his people. Oh, that Korea would shortly become a Christian nation, a missionary nation. And haven't they? They're noted for that. And go to the ends of the earth, preaching the kingdom that is not of this world. And blessed indeed would she be highly favored among nations. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that should be revealed in Korea. I believe a success would attend her efforts that has not followed the labels, labors of others. The harvest is staggeringly large. The time is short. The church is looking toward Korea. I covet this privilege for her. Well,